Yeah, I was at a really interesting phase of development in my life then, really. Um, because what happened to me is um, I had cocaine addiction between 88 and 93, five years really heavy cocaine addiction. And uh, August 93, I got into recovery from that, from addiction. And um, as a result of that, coming into recovery, I kind of had to reappraise sort of my whole life, really. And it was like I was starting off with a blank page, like I was beginning again. And um, I just realised that I felt like I'd been being somebody else, you know, and it was, it was a weird period of time. It was like I, everything was challenging to me, you know, and it was just um, very confusing because, like, I had to confront all of my past uh, and it was overwhelming. And one of the things that that, that really helped though uh, was music. And certain songs just kind of appeared to me during that period and uh, made more sense to me than all of the stuff that was going on in my head, stuff that people, I went to a couple of rehabs that they were talking about. You know, I found confusing, overwhelming, hard to comprehend, but the music kind of, it was almost like a guiding thing, for want of a better phrase. Every now and again, I'd hear a piece of music and it would like, it, some of the tunes would kind of remind me of something I'd lost a long time ago, a sense of innocence or beauty that I just didn't feel, that I felt ugly inside, that I felt. So they were kind of leading me in a way, these tracks. And um, that was in 94, 95. And then I think it was about 96, I thought, okay, I want to do a Dexys album, I had some songs and stuff. But I thought before I do that, what I really need to do is just pay tribute to this period of my life, to these songs, what they've meant to me, and record them. And it was just like I was just following my intuition. So I kind of used the, the songs to kind of tell my own story, really. Give them a second chance. Sure. Um, well, what happened was, <clears throat> I think about 96, 97, I met Alan at a, a gig, I think it was a Beth Orton gig. Beth Orton or Tash McClooney gig, perhaps both of them, in a little pub in the West End. And um, Alan just went, what are you doing? You know, I'd like to talk to you about doing something. And I'd already been talking to a couple of other labels, Warner Brothers and Rough Trade. Um, but I went to see Alan and... Um, you know, he seemed really positive. Played in the demos we had for the Dexys album. He loved them. And then I said to him, look, before we do the Dexys album, I want to do this other album. This, these songs that meant a lot to me. That's, that's got to be my next move. And he went, great. I'll find the greatest love. I'm really enthusiastic about revisiting the album now. You know, um, I was going to sound delighted. I, I am um, a little bit pensive sometimes about how things are received because it's a very, it was a very sensitive subject at the time and the way it was received, you know, I let it affect me and it, or it affected me anyway and negatively, you know. And um, on the one hand, I've been really happy to it, that it's getting a chance to be heard again and looked at in a different way because at the time all of the focus was just on the cover the photographs the look and nothing on the music and they missed the music really the music was missed so i'm really happy and there's been so many myths surrounding this you know that i was booed off at reading i wasn't there was bottles thrown but we completely turned it around at the end and walked off you know victorious um so many myths you know that 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 alan mcgee who you know did a great job and you know financed the album and so on and we're really happy about that but that he that, like that he picked me off the scrap heap you know that wasn't true i was getting my life together that i was mad just because i wore a dress you know it's insane really when you think about it um all, all that stuff and, and more um was just so misunderstood and 
I mean, some of the stuff that was said probably wouldn't even be allowed today, but um, yeah. So I'm really glad to try and um, correct those myths. Um, at the same time, I suppose I feel a little bit pensive because most of it's been really great, the whole, you know, all the interviews. But occasionally, if I feel that somebody's misunderstanding it, it brings me right back there to 99. It's really weird. It almost feels the same, you know. But it's not 1999. Things have changed a lot. And, you know, pretty much, you know, about 99% of the campaign and everything has just been great, you know. People have really well received it well. They're enthusiastic about it. And people are much more open minded now. Reflections of my life. Oh, I am so sad. Totally, totally. It was nobody else, you know. I mean, we've worked with Pete Schweer since Don't Stand Me Down. He mixed it for us. You know, we'd finished the album, we didn't have anyone to mix it. And we went to a good friend called Aaron Chakravarty, who used to master all our records and always did a great job on them. And we said, we don't know, we need someone to mix. Can you, and he said, Pete Schweer. And we went and met Pete, we liked him. He did a fantastic job on Don't Stand Me Down. And wherever I've could since then, like he, he co-produced and mixed uh, One Down Going to Saw, Let the Record Show, and, um, and of course, My Beauty. So, um, yeah, as soon as he was delighted to hear it was getting reissued, being reappraised, and very happy to master it. He's been mastering all that stuff. I mean, we used to go to the best mastering studios, the best mastering engineers. We can be a little bit obsessive. Sometimes we go to one mastering um, studio and get a version, and then we think, not quite right, let's take it somewhere else, go somewhere else, we compare it. In the end, Pete said, you know what, Kevin? I think I know what this needs. Pete, you recorded it. You mixed it and he started mastering it with Marco down at Real World and um, they've done a great job, you know, because so many, so much mastering, one of the difficulties I've found with mastering is it's very easy to completely lose all of the dynamics. A lot of people go for volume, they just get it as loud as possible, but you have to be careful with that because you can just make it all sound and all the kind of levels just flow into another each other. It makes it a kind of a wash of sound. And we didn't want that because there's lots of highs and lows on this and there's a lot of drama in the music. And if you just flatten it all out and make it really loud and punchy, you lose it. So Peach Weir totally understands that. You know? He's our guy. Oh, it was great. I mean, I stayed away from his actual bit because I just felt, I don't know, I talked to Jack Satchel, the director who did a great job, by the way, and Matt Wash. Um, and I just said, maybe I'll stay away. Is that a good idea? They said, yeah, that we just get the vibe. And I came at the end, but I watched, you know, from the sides, I watched him doing a few run-throughs and uh, it was just great. Um, it just felt like, um, a very, I mean, it was great to see him doing that, but it also felt like a kind of a subtle vindication in a way that he's doing something, he's carrying it on, and you know, he's been wearing dresses, makeup since he was 12 or 13, and um, he looks fantastic. And I just felt, I can't put it into words really how I felt when I saw him minding that because I said to him, Look, would you like to do it? He went, Yeah, sure. And um, I don't know, it was just great because he was just so, he looked certainly at ease with himself and did it. And perhaps he wasn't too aware, I don't know, of all the history. I've not really spoken about it. A little bit I've spoken about it, but he just went on and did it. And for him, it's the most natural thing in the world. And it was just, ah, great. When I, I just watched it, I was like, ah, great. certainly are. Um, we've got Reflections of My Life. We did a video, we shot that again with Jack Satchel and Matt Wash and Hugh Man Chan, styling and makeup. And, you know, very involved in it. Um, 
And we've also done, we filmed um, a video for Greatest Love. We actually filmed it the last week of, 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 of before Christmas, I think it was the 19th of December, 2019. Um, and it's got a real Christmas vibe to it, winter. And um, I'm really, really happy with that one. And both of them, but um, Tim, uh, Tim Vegan, our manager, he said that he thinks that Greatest Love is the best video I've ever been involved in. So, so for anybody who doesn't know, when, um, if you, you, anybody can cover any song, you don't have to get permission from anybody, you just cover it. But if you want to change the words, then you need to get permission. So I knew this and uh, about a year before the album came out, I sent, maybe even more, I sent a demo. Um, I, get, I, wrote, uh, I wrote a letter to Bruce Springsteen, the, the writer of the song, obviously, and the singer, uh, a letter explaining why I wanted to change the lyrics to the song so that I could interpret it in my own way. And, um, and, I get, and, and, and together with the demo, and I gave it to Creation Records and I said, look, can you send this off to, and try and get it to Bruce Springsteen? We've got some time because um, we're gonna need permission for this. And they went, all right. And um, just before the album artwork was due to be delivered, I didn't really think any more about it during the recording and I said, did you get, did you get the, that off to Bruce Springsteen? Did you get permission for that track? Went, oh, sorry, we didn't, we didn't send it. But we'll send a fax now asking for permission. And we had like 24 hours or something. And it was the fax to Bruce Springsteen's publishers. Can we change the lyrics to one of these songs? Obviously, no. Any publisher is going to refuse that. So that's what happened. Somehow or other, the myth got around that Bruce Springsteen had heard it. Rubbish. He'd never heard it. He'd never heard it. Um, well, I did read later online that, that he heard it some years later and said, neat, pretty neat, or something like that. But I don't know if that's true. Just somebody wrote that. This time, we've had plenty of time. So I did exactly the same thing. Uh, my manager, Tim Viggan, said, look, we'll get it to Bruce Springsteen people this time, and hopefully to him. I said, okay, great. Did exactly the same thing. I wrote the letter, explained why I wanted to, why I needed to change the lyrics to make it my own. You know, it wasn't that I didn't respect the song, I did, but I needed to get inside it in my own way. And, um, and I also sent my version. Um, Tim took it to Bruce Springsteen's management, who I think they have contacts with Tim's management company. Uh, Magus Entertainment, and uh, we got the m message back pretty quick. Yes, thumbs up. So I'm really happy about that. A beautiful choir, They're all singing for you. They're singing for you. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I haven't even got a record player, <laughs> um, so I'm not a vinyl junkie. I just think if the music is good, it sounds good on you know digital format or whatever. Really. Um, I know, there's, I've, got, I've got lots of friends who, 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 who just swear by vinyl and loads of people said to me over the years, oh, is My Beauty ever going to get a vinyl release, you know, when I'm out DJing or things like that. But is My Beauty going to get a vinyl release? So I know that it's important to a lot of people. So it really was important to get it covered across all formats, really. Honestly, it's been moving. I felt moved by it. Um, yeah, I mean, I was hoping for a positive response, but I didn't know that it was going to be this positive. Yeah, it's been great. I mean, so many great pieces, you know, journalism like um, um, Ted Kessler, Q, and um, Tim Jones, The Guardian. And, um, you know, we reposted those up on Twitter, and which is like vindicated because it really, you know, the whole thing was understood. All the all the myths were laid to rest. And, uh, it's such a relief, that you know, because I mean, I used to have to read all that stuff. 
you know, I might be browsing through the internet or something about Dixies or whatever, and I just read some casual reference, and they just throw in the myth. But they believed it. And, you know, so uh, it's just great to get all that out there and to see a really positive reaction to the music and find out that so many people have got affection for it, you know. It's just very moving, you know, people like, you know, people who've been, people who have found that, um, you know, the album has really meant something to them. It's great.